We are wrapping up a teaching series today called Let's Go Change the World. Have you guys liked this series? And it has so resonated with so many people. And I was thinking about it this morning. It's, it's because it's what we were hardwired to crave, isn't it? Like we all want that. We all have this, this, this craving on the inside of us that says, I want to matter. I want to be significant. I want to make a difference. I, I want to change people's lives. I do want to change the world. The question that we often ask is how, right? I'm just me. Like, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? Because Jesus said to go. That was the whole point, right? He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Take what I've done inside of you and go change the world with it. Where do we go? What do we do? And I think Jesus would say, hey, I am so glad you asked, because let me remind you of what I've already told you. And so we're going to get into this today. In fact, if you have a Bible, you can flip open to John chapter 15. <clears throat> uh, if you're visiting, you might be thinking, hold up a sec. I don't even know if I have anything with me and God, and all we're talking about is going to share it. Why am I here? I understand that. Let me tell you this. I think you're here on the perfect week. Number one, you're going to find out what's really important to us and what this place is all about today. And, and you, you deserve to know that. And, and the second thing is, I would just say this. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, and you're kind of wondering, what am I doing here today? I would say, ask yourself this one question and just let God speak to you for the next 30 minutes. If these people are this passionate about something they think they've experienced with Jesus, that they want to go share it with the world, if they're this passionate is this something I need to experience? Ask yourself that question and let God speak, because I'm telling you we are. I could take this little headset off and go put it on thousands of people literally around the city right now and, and people watching on screens around the world and say, tell us how God has changed your life. And they would get real passionate and probably real teary and tell you, this is how my life is different and this is how it's changed and this is what it's like knowing I'm going to heaven. Like It's a whole new way of life. And we're that passionate about it that we spend four weeks talking about how to take it to the world. So ask yourself, if, if they're that excited, is this something I need? And just let God speak, all right? Jesus, how do we change the world? Where do we go? What do we do? He says, let me tell you. I think the first thing he would say is, stay real close to God. And I almost didn't even want to bring up this point because it almost seems polar opposite, right? You told me to go, and now you're telling me to stay. Right? You're telling me to go, but you want me to just like sit around and read my Bible and talk to God and what, play worship? I'm not a journaler. What do you want me to do? Like, they seem polar opposite, but I think we're going to find out and be reminded that they're not polar opposite. In fact, they go hand in hand, and you can't do one without the other. That's what Jesus said. He said it like this He said, Remain in me. If you want to change the world, you want to do something great, he calls it producing fruit here. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Can't go change the world on your own. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. You will go change things. But apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, I'm the source. I'm what gives you the ability to go change the world. You got to spend time with me first, or you won't have anything to offer when you go try to change something. The iPhone has changed the world. It's true. It, and, and, and some of you are like me. You're old enough to know because you actually lived without one. <laughs> my kids are like, what are you, a hundred? <laughs> like, I remember my mom driving me places and this is how we got there. We would call somebody, and I lived in Kansas, and we would ask, how do you get to your house? And they would tell us directions, and we would write them on a piece of paper. And in, in Kansas, it would be like, go to the third stoplight and turn left, and you go third light left, to the big red barn where you take a right, go down that dirt road until you see a row of trees on your left. You guys know this. This is how we got places. And if you got lost on the way, you couldn't tell them you were lost. You just went home. <laughs> it's just a different life. And then you called them from a phone attached to a wall and said, sorry, bro, I missed the row of trees. I don't like it was a different world. 
Well, I have the worst sense of direction of anyone I know. That's true. And I use my iPhone every single... I've been to my counselor like 50 times. I still put his address in every time I go. Because if I don't, I figure out how to turn somewhere wrong, wrong turn. So I always use it. True story. I'm going to a meeting not too long ago, and I'm like three turns from getting there, and my phone dies. And I don't have my charger. And I was just like... Ah! Like, I... I was like an alien on a new planet. Like, I don't even know what to do right now. I, I can't text him and tell him. I, I can't call Jill and ask where I'm going. I, I, I literally pulled into a gas station and just sat there. I was like, I don't even know how to get home. I, I don't know what to do. It reminded me that, yes, the iPhone has changed the world, but it only changes the world when it's connected to its power source. Too much time away from its power source, and the iPhone's a really expensive paperweight. It just is, isn't it? And, it? and have you ever tried to charge your phone at night, and you wake up in the morning, and it's still dead because the plug was halfway out? Jesus said, I, you can't be halfway out and halfway in on this one. He said, you want to go change the world? You got to stay connected to me, because I'm the one who gives you the power to go do that. Would you put those verses up on the screen? Take a screenshot of this. This is just eight of, we could, have, we could have read a whole bunch more. This is just eight promises where God says, this is how important it is that you spend time with me. Because when you spend time with me, I give you confidence and guidance and protection and power and wisdom and strength, and I'll equip you for your calling, and I'll train you for your mission. You see why it's so important? You can't go change the world without these things. He says, but when you spend time with me, you get these things, and now you're armed and dangerous when you go try to change the world. Amen? So that's what he says. Do you want to, ch want to change your world? Because you got to start by spending some time with me. You're too slow, bro. <laughs> too slow, bro. Uh, I heard him. He goes, up. Oh, no, nope. too slow, bro. <laughs> hey, if you're, if you're new and you're going, man, I don't even know what that means. Don't miss this next series. The next series is called The Word of God, and we're going to get into what the Word of God is, how you know you can trust the Word of God, how to hear God's voice from the Word of God. I'm telling you, don't miss next series. So, so, but I would say this, for, until, until next week, starting Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it's four stories of Jesus' life. Read a chapter a day, say one prayer, and, and I would say put on one song and worship. And you got yourself 15 minutes of power right there, I promise you. That's a good place to start. Jesus said, you want to change the world? It starts with spending time with me. The second thing I think he would tell us, because he told his best friends, and when I say this, you're not going to clap. <clears throat> and um, I don't think his friends clapped when he said it. But he said, guys, if you want to be great, you want to really make a difference in people's lives, do you, if you want to get to the end of your life and be able to look back and not have regrets and go, no, I actually did. I actually helped change people's lives. He said, here's what you want to do. You want to serve and give. He said, listen, guys, you've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, how quickly a little power goes to their heads. You've seen the rich and famous and powerful. It's not going to be that way with you because when they die, nobody cares. It's going to be different with you guys. You're going to be world changers. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He said, guys, take it from me. Watch how I'm living and repeat what you see. Here's what I'm doing. He did not come to serve, but to be served. Sorry, he, he came to serve, not to be served, and then to give. To give away his life in exchange for the many who are held hostage. He said, you want to be great, guys? I'm telling you, it starts with serving and giving. It just does. And, and I want to I ask you to do something real quick. Think of somebody in your life who's made a real difference in your life. And don't just stare at me. Actually do it. Go there mentally. I'll get a drink. You think. Who's one person, maybe two, who's made a real impact on your life? Can you see their face? If we could go around the room at any location, here are the things that you would say. If I said, why would you select that person? Here are the things you would say. They helped me when I was really struggling. They took me in when I had nowhere to go. They gave to me when I was desperate. They pointed me to God. They invited me to church. They loved me. They, they, gave, they spent time with me. They listened to me. They heard me. They sacrificed for me. That's it, isn't it? 
That's the list. That's why they're on your list. And we all know this. We know it deep down inside. We just also have this sort of upside down view of what greatness in this world is. And Jesus said, no, no, I'm telling you, it's not the status and the stuff that'll make you great. It's the serving and giving that'll make you great. That's what'll put you on other people's minds when they say, who's made a difference in your life? And that's what you want. That's greatness. Now, because of what I do for a living, I've been to a lot of funerals. And funerals are, are, are not the same. Some of them are special. And some of them, some of them, you can't, get, you can't get people to stop coming up to the microphone saying things like, let me tell you how she changed my life because she gave to me when, when I, they took me in, they helped me through, they talked me through. When I was really struggling with anxiety and depression, they sat with me and cried. They sat with me and prayed. They get, that's, and they go on and they go on and they go on and you sit there and you just feel inspired and you go, I want to live that way. I want to be remembered that way. Jesus said, I'm not trying to make life difficult for you. I'm trying to help you get to the end of it and, and be somebody who actually made a difference in people's lives. And if you want to be that, you got to give and you got to serve. It's just true. And, and I would say this. I've talked to several people who, who've asked me things like, okay, I do. I want to make a difference. I want to be that person where do I start? And I always say the same thing. Would you put those three questions up? Take a screenshot. Get your phone ready. Take a screenshot. <laughs> he said, get out of the way. <laughs> I hear you. I'm trying to work with you. Hey, I'm telling you right now, these three questions can change the destiny of your entire life. I believe that. God, because of how you've wired me, how can I serve people? This is, this is what I can do. Because of the gifts you've given me and what I can do, how can I serve people? Because of where you have me, because of the people around me where I do life, who can I serve? And because of what you've given me, because of whatever, we all have different levels of, of stuff that God has blessed our lives with, that has given us the ability to earn. Because of what you've given me, how much could I give? I guarantee you, you take these three questions to God this week and give him an honest shot at answering them for you and write down the answer and then pray, God, give me the boldness to go do it. That'll change the way you live. It'll change the way you'll be remembered. Those three questions right there. Based on how you've wired me, where you've got me, and what you've given me, how can I go serve and give? How can I go change the world? And, and generally, it'll start one person at a time, because that's what changing the world is. It's, it's people's lives, right? Usually it starts with one person at a time and the decision to give or serve sacrificially. I've lived it. And here's what's crazy is you never know how God will multiply what you do. When I was 14, my mom gave her life to God and uh, took us to a church in Derby, Kansas. Little bitty church, maybe 100 people. They had a Sunday school class, is what they called it, for us junior high kids. We were too noisy to be over there. And there was a lady in the church who said, well, you have me here. This is my church. And I'm okay with kids. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm okay with kids, so I'll work with the junior high kids. I'll just serve. She was the first person, I'll never forget the day when she told me about heaven and hell. She said, Sean, it's not a game. Like heaven's real, hell's real, and they're forever, and you get to choose. And when she was telling me, I was probably rolling my eyes and talking to the person next to me and not paying attention and probably super annoying, and she probably thought nothing I'm saying matters right now. But it did matter. <clears throat> it did sink in. I got it. I got it so much that when I was 24, I sat down one day to take my own life. I was a drug addict and a bunch of things that happened in life, and I just thought it was the only way out. And I sat down to take my own life, and a roommate of mine had, had previously done this, and, so, and he did it with pills, and so I knew how to do it, and we had the pills. And so I sat down at a table, and I put the pills all across the table, and I had a big thing of water, and, and I was literally getting ready to go. And all of a sudden, Donna's words hit me. What if she's right? What if there is a heaven and a hell? Because if, if there is, I saw this play out, I'm going to be in one of them in 30 minutes. That's how long it's going to take for this to kill me. And I don't know the rules to get in. And I called the only Christian person I knew, and he invited me to a church service just like this. 
And in a service where I had no idea why I was even there with drugs in my pocket, I said, I need that. And God changed my life. I experienced the presence of God in a service just like this. Listen, it was because a lady 10 years earlier had taken a risk and said, I'll just serve somebody. And she had no idea how God would multiply her efforts because I'm just one of the guys who stands up here and gets to talk about Jesus on the weekends. And this year, these messages went to 157 different countries. You want to talk about a world changer? Donna's a world changer with one choice of this is where you got me. This is how you wired me. I'll serve. And when it comes to the giving, I think part of the reason giving shouldn't only happen at church, but I think part of the reason why God set it up the way he did with the tithe at your local church is because you just, we can do more together than we ever could on our own when it comes to changing the world. I've seen that too. In fact, I was shooting hoops with my son this, this week, and I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about this week because, I mean, there's so many things we could talk about, and, and we're shooting hoops, and I was like, Ashton, I said, hey, I'm, I'm finishing the Let's Go Change the World series. What should I, get, what should I tell the church? He's like, I don't know. And I go, no, son, like, if you were going to talk to the church and say, here's what you got to do to change the world, what would you do? And he literally was like, I don't know. Tell them they can't do it by themselves. And I was like, he's right. <laughs> and stop stepping sideways when you, when you shoot. The step back's not for a 13-year-old. I want you straight up and down. <laughs> he's right. I've seen it. When we get together, because listen, I'm, I'm with you. I, I tithe at this church. I give at this church. I'll be praying at the end of this year in our Kingdom Builders series, just like a bunch of you. God, what would you have me do above and beyond my tithe? And when we do this together... We just can do more. And, and I want to share some of what we've been able to do because we don't, I don't think we share this enough. And, and you deserve to see the eternal return on investment for your investment in this church. And as I start talking about money, in case you are new and you go, I don't know this guy and I don't trust his motives and he just wants something from me, we don't need anything from you. This is God's church. And if you feel like God's calling me to start giving but you don't trust us, give to another church and just come here and, and, and take the messages in if you want. I promise. This is not what this church needs. This is God's church. He's got this place. Let me, let me just share a few things we've been able to do because of our corporate giving. Last month, we, um, we found out that there is a young widow in the church, and uh, she was talking with somebody, and it ended up getting to me, and she said, my son's car's broke down, and it's going to be 2500 bucks, and I don't know how we're going to fix it, and he's got to get back to college. And um, this is something my husband would have taken care of. I don't know. And I heard it, and it broke my heart. And uh, so we took her a check the next day. Here's 2,500 bucks to fix the car, and here's another 2,500 bucks to get college started. You don't think we got to change a life that week? <laughs> Listen, that's just a $5,000 story. We have a line item called benevolence, and the whole point of it is to help people in need around all of our churches. And since the beginning of last year, we've given out $492,000 to people in need, just like that. That's what we get to do together. That's changing the world. We work with Compassion International, and as a church family, we spend over a million dollars a year. And this week in Rwanda and Haiti, we are feeding, clothing, educating, and telling about Jesus 2,291 kids. This year, we will spend $1.1 million just on serving the cities around the four buildings in Denver. We, we serve over 30 non-for-profits, over 30 different organizations that all they do is exist to help serve people in the name of Jesus. One of them is called Hope House, which takes in these single teenage moms, and they have nothing, and we get to give them money and help them get started on finding a job and education. That's just one of the 30 we work with. But we'll, we'll take $1.1 million to do that this year. A couple weeks ago, we had a, uh, we had a, we had a youth night called Rep Your School. And uh, go ahead and put those pictures up. Hey, who doesn't want to be at that party? <laughs> we have a line item called Next Generation because we believe if you want to change the world, you got to change the next generation. So we're starting with our children. For our children to be 
getting taught the word of God right now so you guys can sit in the building. For our children to do that, for the youth group, for the young adults, and for our intern program, so we can get this next generation ready to go change the world, we'll spend $1.8 million on staffing and budgets to do that this year. But we're taking it that serious. None of us could do that one on our own, could we? But together, look what we do. Hey, at that youth night, 110 students raised their hand and said, I want to start a new relationship with Jesus. And right now, because we give together, right now, this truck just arrived last night in Fort Myers, Florida, and is right now, as we sit here, handing out food, supplies, and hygiene kits to people who got hit by the hurricane. That's not cheap to do, I promise you. If this is your church, I just want to say thank you. If you've been giving, I want to say thank you. Because you are doing it, God is doing crazy things, and we get to see world changed. We do. And if this is your church and you're not involved, my challenge to you would be just to pray, God, what would you have me do? Go from there. That's between you and God. But I do want it, like I said, I do want you to know the return on your investment. Would you put that slide up? Let me share just a few randoms with you. Since 2018, less than five years, 9.7 million different people have watched a message from Red Rocks Church on YouTube. That's world-changing stuff right there, guys. It's not cheap to do that. 1.4 million hours of church have been watched on YouTube. That's a lot of church. Doug must have been speaking. 157 countries have watched our messages. 6,325 people have been baptized at Red Rocks Church in the 17 years we've been here. And listen, some of you have been giving faithfully for a long time, so I'm real excited to share this with you. In the 17 years that we have been a church, this is how many people have given their life to God. That we know of. That's people that have raised their hand and said, I want to start a relationship with Jesus. That's 2,000 more people than fit at Coors Field. And this is the coolest part. That's 10% of the population of Denver when we moved here in 2005. We're making a difference, church, and we're just getting started. Last thing is this. Go ahead and put that recap slide up. I want everybody to know where we've been. Stay close to God. I think Jesus would say, you want to change the world? Stay, stay close to me. Serve. Give. And then go share what I've done in your life with some boldness. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, and you can turn to it if you want, because we're going to read a few verses. Acts 4, starting at verse 29. Acts 4, 29. Some of the disciples had been out talking about Jesus. They're starting the church, okay? When Jesus left, there was barely over 100 people who said, I think I believe in this thing. That's what they started with. And they're, they're starting the church. They're trying to take this message to the world. And they don't know what they're doing. They're just talking about Jesus and that he came back from the dead and that he can forgive your sins and he can refresh your life. And The authorities don't like it. Because they're talking about how Jesus was the Son of God. Well, the people in charge are the ones who had him crucified, and that doesn't make them look very good. So they arrest these guys, put them in prison, then threaten to kill them, threaten them with their lives, and they have the legal power to kill them. So they basically say, if you talk about Jesus again, we will kill you. Can you imagine if that was the pressure you took to work with you? If I talk about Jesus here, they'll kill me, and they can? If I talk about Jesus at my school, they'll kill me, and they can. Like That's a whole new level of pressure, isn't it? They get out of jail. They go get with their friends, and they pray. And I was reading it this week, and I went, yeah, I would too. And I know what I'd be praying, and so do you. God, help me. God, protect us. God, keep my family safe. They've threatened our lives. We're like, we're in trouble. Please protect us, God. Protect my kids. Bring us peace. My anxiety is at an all-time high. Bring us peace. We need comfort, right? This is what they prayed. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. This week, they said, we're not praying, make me comfortable. This week, we're praying, make me dangerous. 
Stretch out, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Listen to this. After they prayed, after they said, I'm not just going to pray for comfort this week. This week, I'm going to pray, make me dangerous. This week, I'm going to pray, give me some boldness. After they prayed that prayer, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Hey, and listen, what was 100 people is now 2.4 billion people on the planet. To a group of people who said, I'm not just going to pray, make me comfortable, but I'm going to pray, make me bold, has changed the world. Red Rocks, I was thinking about something, and, and I take this stuff very serious. I was thinking this week, I may have accidentally given you a, a wrong impression this year on what the goal of us and God is. I may have done you a bit of a disservice, and I didn't mean to, but because of what I've just struggled with, which was a lot of anxiety and stuff, and then came out with the book, and then we did a big series on attacking anxiety, and then we went through Philippians, and we spent a lot of time talking about joy. What started to hit me this week is you could, this could be your church, and you could start to get the idea that if I get close enough with God, the end game is he's going to make me comfortable. I'm going to have peace. I'm going to have joy. I'm going to be healthier. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be better. And then I'll just be happy and comfortable, and that's the goal. And that's not the goal. Following Jesus was never meant to be safe. He does want us to have peace and joy and purpose and make us whole, but not so we can sit and be comfortable, so that from that place we can get dangerous and go out into the world and change things. The goal is not just make me comfortable. And some of us, me included, we've gotten too comfortable and we forgot about our calling. We're supposed to go change the world and it's going to take a group of people that says, make me bold today. What if this week, every day before you went to school or work or the office or the gym or the neighborhood or whatever you're... God, you know the things going on in my life. But this life is short and it's not a game. And heaven and hell is real. And there are three million people in the Denver metro area. And what you've given me could change their eternity. So today, don't just make me comfortable. Today, would you make me dangerous? Give me the boldness. Give me the boldness to go to work and find an opportunity to share my life with somebody until there's a chance to share my story, until there's a chance to share my church, until there's a chance to share my faith. God, make me bold. Think about, there's thousands and thousands of us watching this together right now. These guys changed the world with less than 100. Think about if we got together and prayed, make me bold. Think about if we got together and said, I'm going to spend some time with God so when I actually go to change the world, I am going to be dangerous. And I'm going to give sacrificially. And I'm going to serve sacrificially. And I'm going to pray, make me bold. And I am going to go change the world because it's not a game. That's the church I want to be a part of. Not a comfortable church, a dangerous church. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're with us right now. I thank you that we, can, we feel your presence. I thank you that you're speaking. I pray, God, that you would build our faith today. No guilt. Just build our faith and excitement about what could be. Put some names on our heart. Put some faces on our minds. And give us the courage to go to all nations. With everyone's eyes closed at all locations, I want to ask two questions. The first one is this. You are a Christ follower. Maybe you're a new Christ follower. Maybe you've been doing this for a long, long time. And if you were honest, you'd probably say, you know what? I've probably gotten too comfortable. And today, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have pray this courageous prayer. God, make me bold. Make me dangerous. If that's you, raise your hand, and I'm just going to pray together. I'm going to believe for some things to start happening. Amen. 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 The second question is this. You don't have a relationship with Jesus at all. In fact, you don't even know why you came to church or are watching or listening online right now, except for now you do know, because God has got your attention in a way that you didn't even see coming, and you can't really explain it, but you can just feel it in your heart. 
It's the creator of the universe lovingly drawing you into a relationship with him right now. That's what's happening. And you can feel it. You sense it in your heart. And you're going, this is my moment. I need to experience what these guys have experienced. I need to, I need to be forgiven of my sins. I need to experience the life-changing power of Jesus. I want his spirit in me in the here and now, and I want heaven forever. And you know right now, this is your moment. If that's you right now, raise your hand. I'm going to say a prayer for you. Raise them up high. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Raise them up. Praise God. God behind bars. Raise them up. Praise God. God, I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that you're speaking. I thank you that you're encouraging. I thank you that you do empower us, that you do equip us, that you do guide and protect us as we go. And God, we pray for some boldness as a church family today. God, make us dangerous to the kingdom of hell so that we can build the kingdom of heaven on this earth in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's worship, church.